What was the political world of Judaism like when John the Baptist and Jesus came to public ministry? According to Flavius Josephus, a first century Jewish historian and apologist, there existed during the first century three main Jewish sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The second census officiated by Quinarius, governor of Syria, around 7 AD, resulted in the Sephorius Revolt. This revolt caused Rome to declare the tribal territory of Judea as a Roman province. The loss of political sovereignty enraged militant-minded Jewish patriots to band together to form a fourth political sect known as the Zealots. The three main Jewish sects were deeply religious in nature, while the Zealots were militantly political who used religion as a means to gain their political ends. The origins of the Sadducees and the Pharisees comes from the Maccabean period that commenced in 168 BC with the Jewish revolt against Hellenism and Syrian rule and ended in 37 BC with the inauguration of the Herodian dynasty by Caesar Octavian and Mark Anthony. During the bloody years of Syrian occupation, the priests of Israel identified themselves with Anicus IV and Jason, the puppet high priest, who purchased his position from Antiochus with a large sum of money and an agreement to pollute Judaism with Greek polytheism. The Sadducees represented the wealthy aristocratic priesthood who compromised with the Syrians in order to maintain their wealth and position. Josephus noted that the Sadducees were those who gained only the rich and had not the people on their side. The Sadducees were more than just the priesthood. They were the aristocratic wealthy of Judaism. The Sadducees acknowledged only the written law and rejected the entire rabbinic interpretation developed during the centuries by the scribes. Although these aristocratic priests rejected the tradition of the elders, they did not reject the prophets. In regards to legal matters, Josephus noted that the Sadducees were very rigid in judging offenders above all the rest of the Jews. After the Babylonian captivity, the priests and the scribes determined the inner development of Israel. The Sadducees came from the ranks of the priests, while the Pharisees came from the ranks of the scribes. During this period of history, the Pharisees developed their religious legal opinions, while the Sadducees developed their social position. During the Hellenistic Maccabean period, the chief priests and the rulers developed an increasingly low attitude toward the law and the political influence of the Pharisees. The Pharisees became the religious voice of the people, while the Sadducees were the political voice of the aristocracy. The Pharisees believed that they were the pure ones who were separated to a life of purity and study. The development of their religious code was designed to influence and control the common people because the Pharisees were losing political control to the Sadducees. The tradition of the elders was more a political tool used to control the illiterate masses than religious interpretation. During the time of Jesus Christ, the Sadducees became the political voice of the government, while the Pharisees maintained control of the common people by their religious manipulations and the code of the elders. The Pharisees feared Christ because they could not control him with their traditions in the same way they controlled the illiterate Jewish masses, while the Sadducees feared Christ because he disrupted the status quo of their political power. After the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans, the Pharisaic sect was reorganized as Rabbinic Judaism that produced the Judaism we see today. Two classes of rabbinical courts are identified in the Talmud, both with the name of Sanhedrin. The lesser Sanhedrin was the municipal courts of the nation, with each city having one such court. The lesser courts consisted of 23 judges, but the great Sanhedrin of Jerusalem had 71 judges who acted as the supreme court of Judaism. 
The great Sanhedrin became the melting pot of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. According to history, the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated each other and were in constant conflict because of their doctrinal application of Scripture, especially the doctrine of the resurrection. But due to their mutual hatred of Jesus Christ, these warring factions put aside their doctrinal differences to plot the murder of Jesus. The third main religious group that flourished during the first century was the Essenes, who were an ultra-conservative religious group who strongly believed in eschatology and the coming messianic age. This group was ascetic and mystical in their pursuit of God. And several groups organized communes in the desert of Judea in order to maintain a monastic lifestyle. Most famous of these desert dwellers was the commune at Koram, the location of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Analysis of these scrolls revealed that this religious group required all third-year probationary members to take an oath that committed their life to God in righteousness and to maintain a life of purity. The Essenes maintained a strong belief in the immortality of the soul after death. They also held a fundamental Jewish view of the world and God. This group had more in common with the Pharisees than the Sadducees. The Essenes disappeared from history after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. The Zealots were a Jewish political movement more than a religious denomination. They sought to incite the people of Judea to rebel against Rome. They attempted to expel the Roman legions from Israel during the great Jewish revolt that was fought between 66 AD to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The thorn in the side of these political militants was the introduction of the imperial cult of Rome into Jewish law and society. These extremists objected to Roman rule and sought violently to eject them from their lands. They raided Jewish homes and killed Jews they thought to be collaborators. After the destruction of Jerusalem and the Second Temple in 70 AD, 960 zealots took refuge by capturing the Roman fortress of Masada. Rome sent the 10th Legion to attempt to retake the stronghold for nearly three years. It is estimated that the Romans incurred over 1,000 casualties in the process. The zealots continued to hold the fortress even after the Romans invented new types of siege machines. Finally, in the third year of the siege, Rome, unable to take the fortress intact, gave up and burned the walls down. When the Romans stormed in to take the zealots prisoner, they found that their fighters and their families had nearly all committed suicide rather than live a life of slavery. There is one other political group mentioned in the Gospels, and that is the Herodians. The Herodians were a sect mentioned in the New Testament on two occasions, once in Galilee and again in Jerusalem. On both occasions, they displayed hostility toward Jesus Christ. Most historians believe that this political party consisted of Herod's court and his soldiers. This political party was small in number and very loyal to King Herod who they believed to be the true king of the Jews and the Messiah. Into this world of political hostility and religious intrigue, John the Baptist began his public ministry. Luke noted that John lived in the desert until he made his public appearance in Israel. As was previously stated, at the time of Jesus, the desert of Judea was a dwelling place for Messianic religious groups like the Essenes, who dedicated themselves to study and prayer at their desert monasteries. It is entirely possible that John spent his formative years among the Essenes at Quaram, near the Dead Sea, the site of the discovered Dead Sea Scrolls. The case for John coming from Quaram is reinforced by John's attire and his dietary habits. Matthew chapter 3 verse 4 John's clothes were made of camel hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. 
The eating of locusts causes us to think that the diet of John was that of the very poor. But recent examination of the Dead Sea Scrolls cast a different light upon this meager diet. It was discovered that Essenes, especially the community at Quaram, typically ate locusts and wild honey in order to avoid unclean foods. John's camel hair attire was also typical of the Essen communities from this time period. Camel hair cloth was coarse and inflexible. The material is also known as burlap or sackcloth. Due to its coarse nature, this type of cloth was worn by ascetics as a means to chasten the desires of the flesh. From John's attire and his diet, we may conclude that he is an Essene, maybe from Karam and the Dead Sea Scrolls. According to the Bible, the word of the Lord came to John while he was in the wilderness. The word of the Lord did not come to John in the courts of kings or the city of Jerusalem, but it came to him in the midst of the Judean desert. This is a clear indication that John's lifestyle and ministry was outside the established religious order. Mark chapter 1, verse 4 through 8. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And this was his message. After me will come one, more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. To understand the true controversy found in the message of John and Jesus, we must understand that Judaism believed their physical descent from Abraham determined acceptance in the kingdom of God. The Pharisees claimed that they were sons of the kingdom by virtue of their descent from Abraham and adherence to the law of Moses. The doctrine of physical descent created tremendous national pride in their religious system. The Jewish leadership looked for a Messiah to be a political leader sent to establish a political kingdom that would deliver them from Roman occupation. A perfect example of this religious superiority is found in the discourse Jesus had with the Jews recorded in John chapter 6. The Jews believed that Moses gave them manna in the wilderness, not God. This trust in Moses, not God, was the root of the Sanhedrin's rejection of Christ. Jesus quickly rebuked his hearers for this error. God gave Israel manna, not Moses. He was only God's tool. It's apparent from this scripture that the foundation of the Jewish religious system was Abraham and Moses, not God. The idea of Jewish people needing ceremonial water baptism was insulting to both the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Water baptism for the repentance of sin was reserved only for non-Jewish proselytes to Judaism. To tell Jewish people that they must identify themselves with non-Jewish Gentiles was offensive and challenged the prevailing rabbinic doctrine concerning salvation. John insisted that everyone must come to God on the same terms. John came from the desert with the word of God burning in his heart. He came in fulfillment to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 through 5. A voice of one crying in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The message from John was simple and clear. Repent, for the kingdom of God is drawing near. John was a voice crying in the wilderness, working to prepare the way for the Messiah, to make straight a path for God into the hearts of a proud and arrogant nation. John knew that his ministry would be to the humble and poor, the small valleys of a broken nation, while at the same time he understood 
that his mission would bring low every proud mountain and hill. He would rebuke the proud religious system of Judaism and the corporate Sanhedrin for their national sin. John came with a message that rebuked the crooked way while Jesus came to reveal the straight and narrow way. John's prophetic vision would also inflame the controversy because the concept of giving the light of God to all mankind would be offensive to rabbinic thinking that perceived the Gentile nations as unclean. On at least one occasion, John noticed a large contingent of Pharisees and Sadducees come to observe his ministry at the Jordan River. They clearly did not come to be baptized like a pagan convert. And then who are they? The Sanhedrin of Jerusalem wanted to judge the controversial mission of John. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 through 12. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barns and burning up the chafe with unquestionable fire. John noticed this assembled group of learned elders. He did not see humble hearts seeking understanding. What he saw was a generation of poisonous vipers with death on their lips. John's message went right to the root of the problem. You think you're saved because you're a descendant of Abraham. God could raise up descendants of Abraham out of dead stones if he wanted to. John also warned the Sanhedrin delegation that the Messiah is coming with the Holy Spirit and fire. God is going to clean his threshing floor. Those who repent and turn to him will be gathered to his side, while the arrogant proud will be burned with unquenchable fire. Literally, this burning did occur in 70 AD when Rome sacked and burned Jerusalem and Herod's temple. What do you think this delegation thought of John and his message? Needless to say, their return to Jerusalem was not a joyous adventure. John was an equal opportunity offender. He also turned his attention on King Herod Antipas and his family. Luke chapter 3 verses 18 and 19 And with many other words John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done. John strongly rebuked Herod for his illicit marriage to Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. The Gospel narrative records that Herodias was married to Philip, the son of King Herod the Great and brother to Herod Antipas. Most historians agree that this Philip was not the Tetrarch, of Ituria and the region of Traconius, according to the Jewish historian Josephus. Although Philip was in the line of succession, he was passed over in the wills of Herod the Great. Herodias was married to a Herod who would not be king. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see why the ambitious Herodias left her husband for Herod Antipas. John's prophetic anger burned hot against Herod for his blatant violation of Leviticus marriage law. We might think that Herod's hatred of John was based solely on his moral rebuke, but this may not be the case. Herod was engaged in a political struggle with a Nabatine king over the territory of Perea, the region where John's preaching occurred. John's ethical rebuke could upset the political balance 
in the smoldering populace of Perea, giving ethical allies to his opposition. How did Herod Antipas respond to John? Luke chapter 3 verse 20 Herod added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. What would become of John now that he is in prison? A provocative dance of a young woman would determine his fate. When did John begin his ministry? When we date the ministry of John, we also date the ministry of Jesus. Again, we turn to the Gospel of Luke to provide the chronology that will accurately date the ministries of John and Jesus. Luke chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituinia and Taconius, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. The fact that Luke noted that the ministry of John began during the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar is all that is needed to place this event in history. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar is both the terminus a quo, the earliest limiting point, and the terminus ad quem, the latest limiting point. Tiberius Caesar reigned for 23 years, from 14 AD to 37 AD. Among Bible historians, there is considerable debate concerning the dating methods used by Luke. Should Luke use the Hebrew calendar in Nisan 1 for dating purposes, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar would be from April 15th of 28 AD to April 4th of 29 AD. But should he use a Syrian method of dating from the time of Augustus, the 15th year would be from September 21st of 27 AD to October 8th of 28 AD. Some scholars believe Luke used the normal Roman method of dating. This would make the 15th year from August 19th of 28 AD to August 18th of 29 AD. Who is right? How do we clarify this debate? Luke chapter 3 verse 23. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. Luke understood that the ministry of Jesus began near his 30th year. This verse does not explicitly state that Jesus was 30 years of age, but near that age. Jesus could have been as old as 33. From church tradition, we understand that the ministry of Jesus was approximately three years in duration, with his death occurring during the Passover of 33 AD. From these facts, we can conclude that John baptized Jesus sometime in 29 AD and the commencement of Jesus' ministry to be before the Passover of 30 AD. Who is John the Baptist? Some might think he'd be a prophet, and they would be right. He was the prophet spoken of by Malachi, at the conclusion of the Old Testament. John the Baptist would come in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the children of Israel back to the piety of their fathers. Malachi chapter 4 verse 4 through 6 Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and the laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. The scribes, Pharisees, and teachers of the law prided themselves on adherence to the law of Moses. But the mission of John the Baptist would be to remind the religious arrogant of the true spirit found in the law of Moses. 
John came to turn the hearts of the children of Israel back to Jehovah and to restore the national vision to the true meaning and purpose of the law. What did John the Baptist do for the children of Israel? He stripped away all the religious rhetoric and debate and answered the one question that all human flesh should ask. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. What did God want of the children of Israel? And what does he want of us today? God is not honored in the arrogance of our foolish religious debate. He found no honor in the rabbinic legalism encrusted around the heart of the law of Moses. Nor does he find honor in our divisive denominational debate. What does the Lord require of us in our pursuit of his will? But to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God.